without further ado, bonjour Eric, bonjour la francophonie. Um, we have the pleasure to have Eric Mochelon with us, who is counselor for the National French Commission at UNESCO. Eric has been involved in uh, um, more than 20 years in projects, multinational uh, um, projects and um, international cooperation projects. And um, today uh, you are going to talk to us um, about the, um, OER, the French national OER strategy and projects. So, without a further ado, uh, thank you very much. The floor is yours, Eric. Thank you very much. Thank you for your invitation. Uh, of course, I'm going to, to talk to you from a state perspective, and uh, you'll understand why in a, in a few minutes. Um, in the field of, of OER, uh, states face a, a number of challenges in developing their strategies which are themselves determined by their political, normative, and budgetary competences, and they are, of course, different. States also have to make choices, taking into account a number of paradoxes that I would like to discuss with you. And this function of choice is the very heart of political activity. And France is now in the process of completely revising its OER strategy. And the crossroads at which we find ourselves depends on the path we have traced yesterday. And the problems we face are therefore specific to our national situation, which may be similar to that of other countries, although I don't necessarily know. But beyond this possible proximity, it seems to me that our problems and our questions can also become an interesting source of reflection and perhaps of lesson for all. And I hope that what I have to say will echo your own concerns and enable us to reflect together. This is why I, I would like, I would first like to put into perspective the difficulties that uh, the implementation of these strategies represent in the national context before opening the field of my reflections to problems that we may encounter as states and then as players in the education market. First, I would remind you that OER is also a French history. The birth of French OER is rooted in a liberal faith and immediately raised cultural and legal barriers. What is this liberal faith? France was a pioneer in OER when it invited all universities to embark on the adventures 20, year ago, 20 years ago. This, um, technophile and enthusiastic approach is surprising from a French perspective, because France is known for its Jacobinism. The state likes to centralize and control since the French Revolution. And to combat this tendency, France has been decentralizing since the 1980s. And universities have taken advantage of this movement to undertake the production of their educational resources. And they did so individually, unlike the open universities models we know in the Anglo-Saxon world or the virtual universities in Africa, for instance. They are none in France. Since 2003, thematic digital universities, UNT in French, I'll call them TDU during my, my, uh, my presentation, have been created and funded by the Ministry of Higher Education. And for students or professors, they are universities in name only, since they do not enroll students and do not grant degrees or diplomas. Their role is to produce, disseminate, and share information for teachers, OER, MOOCs, placement tests, training courses, and so on. The first consequence of this precociousness is that the digital universities have not necessarily harmonized the legal dimension of the adventure by ensuring that the Creative Commons license was well integrated into their production. Creative Commons was born in 2001, but was not well known at the time. Second consequence, the catalogs were created locally without centralization in terms of indexing, standardization, curation, or harmonized updating. It was therefore necessary to create thematic portals on the websites of each TDU and then a common engine to index the content of OER catalogs that produced. 
And this centralization has been taking shape since 2017. The result has been an abundance of resource initiatives, but sometimes just as many obstacles to their consultation, reuse, use for other purposes, adaptation, and free redistribution by others, which is the very definition of OER. So we've got a situation where freedom is against freedom. And the problem is that once you have given free someone freedom, you cannot take it away. When the state wanted to put some order in all this, government initiatives on digital education were superimposed on top of each other instead of replacing the existing. And the eight French uh, thematic digital universities now fall under four different legal regimes. Inter-university service, foundation, public interest grouping, which is a legal person under public law, or simply the department of the association of directors of, univers of university institutes of technology. And six of these eight digital universities are now united in an association called the digital university, but it does not even include them all. Moreover, although their vocation is similar, each of them defines its editorial policy in a logic of autonomy and its contents according to its own needs. So at least indexing is done on the basis of shared standards. Then we have a cultural barrier. We have often heard the open education revolution equated with the invention of the printing press. To say that is a truism. By definition, any scientific innovation disseminated to the public leads to transformations in our behavior and relationship to others, to money, and to knowledge. And open education refers to a movement of ideas, a community of people, and different types of contents. And this is the problem. It's a bit of everything at once. And this confusion is delaying its development. In France, before the COVID pandemic, less than a quarter of French students and teachers were using OER. And this lack of awareness contrasted sharply with the digital practices and aspirations of the educational community. The, the use of internet was already massive, if not total, and there were hardly any students who didn't use the internet in their studies and very few teachers who didn't use it to prepare their lessons. There was thus a huge gap between private practice, professional practice, and expectations. And the pandemic may not have tidied up the supply of OER, but it has undoubtedly spurred producers and users to make new efforts. And we'll, we've all been talking for uh, 21 hours now about the need to maintain this momentum. And this, is, this raises the question of how to include OER in curricula, on the one hand, and in teachers' careers, on the other. And these questions are open today. They, they arise in France, and of course, in a Francophony environment and for political reasons in a European context. So we have a lot of questions at the different political levels. Besides, teachers, pupils and students all want to teach and learn in their own language. And by embarking on an adventure in French, the French have inevitably locked themselves into a cultural hole. And it's unfortunate that it's too often presented in opposition to the globalized OER world in English. And the tools of artificial intelligence in natural translation will undoubtedly allow us to learn in our language while taking advantage of the resources of other languages. Then after the cultural barrier, there's a legal one. The integration of digital technology into education raises a series of issues, we've been talking about that, related to intellectual property and copyright law. And if not adjusted, the law seriously hampers the day-to-day -day teaching mission and exposes the teacher and the students to significant legal liability. And in order to prevent irregularities and promote the use of multimedia documents, the French legal framework has incorporated the principle of the educational exception. It's not enough. Firstly, because users can't get rid of the confusion between free, open, and gratuitous, which are sometimes difficult to translate into different languages. And secondly, because they get lost, 
between the rights to copy, to transform, to redistribute, and to make commercial use of a work, plus the copyright, which in France prevails in the hierarchy of norms over the right created by the Creative Commons license. And professors have understood that most of open universities are the best because they multiply the power of attraction, but they have little idea of what they are allowed to do and worse, the legal framework in which they do what they do. So the adjustments to intellectual property rights provided for in the educational exception are and remain extremely complex and illegible for both teachers and students, which encourages civil, civil disobedience. And for this reason, in many cases, OER is only of interest if it adds value, and it adds value when the law is broken. It, it is made available to the public by academics who are unscrupulous in the noble sense of the word. That is to say, who pay little attention to the legal dimension of their own work because they are thinking primar primarily about content. And for their part, administrative officials legitimately concerned about this legal precariousness, prefer to adopt the principle, when in doubt, abstain. So the state now is in trouble. The state has to face the problem of control, dissemination, and hybridation. Let's talk quickly about control. One of the first questions that can be asked when faced with the availability of EOR is that of the control of their content. Paradoxically, in an intellectual community that doesn't claim to be market-driven, OER are liberal. The producers of OER believe from the outset, without really asking the question, that users would quickly sort out the quality content from the non-quality content. In short, they decided to trust the invisible hand. The idea here is that all the individual actions of the players guided by the personal interest of each one, that is to say the dissemination of knowledge, contribute to wealth and the common good. And wealth here is both the wealth of the supply in quantity and its intellectual value. But unlike the Anglo-Saxons or South Americans, for instance, the French have always preferred to rely on the state as the controlling authority in the name of the general interest. Uh, there's no lack of free and virtuous models. Uh, Wikipedia is the first example known to all. Blockchain can also promise guarantees. Nevertheless, this French prudence is not absurd because we see so many absurdities talked around the world every day. And the quality control of an intellectual product can be done in three ways. By an external body that has the authority to publish and modify the resource. By the producers themselves, in a logic of emulation and by users who are able to judge the contribution of the resource and its capacity to satisfy that demand, the demand. And today, scientific and editorial councils within universities and digital universities producing resources must validate the content intended to be put online. But what about the users? By definition, they're not, they're not supposed to possess the, the knowledge and the critical mind uh, due to the lack of serious education on the internet. I will not dwell on the ability to share. Uh, in the plane, if the pressure drops, you have to put your oxygen mask on first and then help anyone who needs it. In the case of OER, we have experienced being able to help others before we have solved all these problems, uh, especially in uh, Sahel and West Africa. Um, we, we we had not long ago um, uh, a forum on open education resources in the Sahel and West Africa, and we took stock of various projects and cooperation. And our discussions focused on the need to identify and share existing resources and train their users. And a similar initiative exists for higher education, coordinated by the International Council for Open and Distance Education. And by mobilizing the Francophonie network in 10 countries of West Africa and French-speaking Sahel, the Imagine Ecole system should make it possible to reach more than 6.6 .6 million pupils and their teachers. You are all, I imagine, I imagine familiar with the 
this regional platform developed within the framework of UNESCO's Global Coalition for Education. It, it aims to ensure pedagogical continuity to pool educational resources and strengthen the capacities of those involved in distance education. In particular, it makes available the resources of the French Ministry of Education with a view to mutual enrichment. And France also presented a number of initiatives taken in response to the crisis. The School at Home platform, uh, set up by the National Center for Distance Learning with 1.3 million accounts created, the EduSchool portal with resources for pupils and teachers, the mobilization of public broadcasting with uh, programs on TV and radio, and the partnership with the post office to ensure continuity of uh, education for pupils who didn't have access to technology, and the Learning Nation and e-homework dawn programs to allow for increased homework help during holidays. And to me, all these experiences highlight two realities. On the one hand, our OER efforts need to be embedded in mechanisms of cooperation, capacity sharing and monitoring of OER use as recommended by UNESCO. Second, on the other hand, the use of radio, TV and postal services should remind us that OER issues cannot be reduced to digital policy issues. OER is 99% digital in the richest countries, but it's not the case worldwide. And it's essential to keep this in mind. The third challenge is about the relationship to the screen and hybridity. Some states, but not all, feel they are finally exercising social and health responsibilities. And the example of cooperation between France and some West African countries remind us that hybridity remains a challenge. OER are not simply digital resources to replace the old fashioned classroom. We know perfectly well that, that the screen doesn't replace the teachers and replaces them even less when the pupil is younger. Flipped education was popularized by the Cannes Academy. It reverses the linear model of teaching by encouraging the student to watch videos on fundamental concepts before the class. For young children, this method is catastrophic. And we must not lose sight of the fact that teenagers already spend far too much time in front of screens. If we add hours of online lessons to them, it will unfortunately not replace the hours they spend on other activities. So we still need a lot of work to increase digital literacy, to build a sustainability model for OER, to find the best arguments to demonstrate their strategic advantages, and to really optimize the hybridization of learning. That is to say the combination of distance and classroom learning, listening and autonomy on the basis of pedagogical engineering adapted to different types of schools and university audiences. Now I would like to, to start the last of my three points about the markets, OER and the price of things. I would like to go back a moment to the first steps of the internet. I'm talking about the time that people under 30 cannot know if some of you remember the Aznavour song. This little backtracking will allow me to address the questions of free access, evaluation, and the role of operators and the part played by the market. First, the challenge of free access. In 2001, MIT President Charles Best kicked off the race for educational innovation. He announced that all the educational content and courses used by the MIT professors would be accessible on the internet free of charge and reusable by others. This announcement was in keeping with the spirit of the previous decade. The first users of the internet dreamt of a world where everything online would be free, including access to knowledge. In 2001, this was already a long way off. The previous year, the internet bubble had already burst. It was just a time to, to try to rebuild the moribund ideal. In France, such an announcement could not be the subject of revolution. Education was already free for all. And at university, it's so cheap that it's practically free. The problem is that free is only ever the perception of the user. There's always someone who pays. And in France is the public authorities trapped 
in the market of educational publishers. The result is that pupils, students, and their parents feel much less need for OER. So if freedom has worked against freedom at the beginning, free access has also worked against free access. And the development of OER therefore requires the liberation of the public authorities from their own model in a logic of cost reduction. And this is a cultural revolution. It must take into account the economic reality of open education. While the use of OER is often free, its production is by definition never free. It even implies heavy investments. And in the absence of business models, a loss of income for universities, they need to compensate for this, firstly with branding benefits, as OER is an institutional, institutional showcase, but it doesn't mean that there will be that there will not be future business models. As a reminder, the French platform FUN offers the possibility for teachers to charge students for a certificate of achievement for the exams concluding a MOOC. Teachers who choose this option tend to choose less open license. OER thus allows ind indirect financial revenue to be obtained from pedagogical investment without compromising free access to the course. In general, in France, we can see that teachers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics have more open practices than in the health and especially the business and law sectors. The more is involved with disciplines that deal with the price of things, the more things have a price. And the more competitive issues push them to choose the closed license. OER requires even more investment as many resources as if are ephemeral and need to be updated as research progresses. The Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation currently spends 120,000 euros per year and per TDU. This is obviously very insufficient, if only to pay the salaries of the permanent employees involved in the production of digital content. The TDUs have to respond to calls for projects for the hybridization of training and find additional funding themselves. So just as money eventually brought order to the internet jungle of the 1990s, so it is not impossible that money will soon bring order to the world of OER. And the issue of OER as a public good is therefore likely to become even more acute. I would like, this is my second uh, sub point, I would like to link this idea to the UNESCO's recommendations. It calls on us to establish research mechanism to evaluate the effectiveness of OERs, to collect and disseminate data on progress, good practice, innovations, and research reports on OER and its impact, and to develop strategies for monitoring its educational and financial effectiveness. Regional and global collaboration on OER should even enable governments and education providers to assess the quality of open content and optimize their investments. And France invested early on in various operators capable of providing portals to institutions, pooling resources and promoting consortia of institutions. In keeping with the pioneering spirit of OER, it has sought to make resources poolable and transferable, both to avoid the model of the lone teacher producing their own resource and that of the university reserving its products for its students. We have seen OER accessible via portals reserved for professors with an academic email, for instance. So in France, the agreements on objectives and resources signed between the ministry and TDUs systematically provide for the monitoring of indicators. But in the end, it is the operator who has the existing data. However, in absolute terms, if this operator is private in a market logic, not in a French one, in a general market logic, it is to optimize its investments and not those of the state that it will exploit them. If that this data. Hence, the importance in France for the public authorities of a compulsory report in the annual balance sheet requested from the TDUs each year via their association. These indicators are then used to guide the political action of the ministry concerning OER and the operators. And uh, the TDUs remain non-profit associations. Let's ask ourselves, for a moment, what data we're talking about. There are mainly two kinds of data. On the one hand, the content to be indexed and its evolution. 
And on the other hand, the traces left by users. Content tracking is essential to enable OER producers to estimate the expectations and needs of those who come to learn and the ability of producers to meet that intellectual demand. And this data can itself be approached either quantitatively or qualitatively. The former data, the quantitative one, relates to audience and downloads. It cannot be complete since by definition, the reuse of OER implies an acceptance of losing track of it once it leaves an institution's own digital learning environment, such as, such as uh, the Moodle platform, which is largely dominant in France. The second data, qualitative, can only be collected through a process of interviews and questionnaires with stakeholders, and they are necessarily fragmentary. This doesn't mean that these data are not decisive, of decisive importance, but they, that the recommended evaluation is by definition wishful thinking. And why? And we see already that the market is in ambush. This is my, my last point. Given the sums involved in producing and disseminating OER, the natural operators most capable of performing the full functions of financing this production and dissemination are now the big tech giants. Indeed, they, they, they got into battle order to capture the huge market share of online education, including OER. And for them, the investment involved is small compared to the benefits envisaged. Indeed, it's nothing less than collecting data from OER users. It's often said that on the internet, if it's free, you are the product. This is not the case here. If OER are free in the business model, even if they have to fund them, it's because their users are not the product, they are the or. YouTube is full of OER, including French language ones, because it's easier to place resources there than on academic portals that respect national rights. But YouTube is Google, not a search engine as 99% of users believe, but an advertising agency that sells personal data and has a search engine to collect it. And its resources are infinitely superior to those of most states in a game where the winner takes it all. Fear of the unknown, that's to say of the imposed platform and legal hesitation, play into the hands of the big tech giants. And at the moment, YouTube strongly limits the formats of possible OERs as it only offers video, but this is very restrictive compared to rich and interactive formats but there's nothing to say that it will not offer tomorrow options closer to LinkedIn Learning or Open Classroom, which compete with the offers of universities by being partially free or totally paid. If evaluation is wishful thinking, the respect for privacy recommended by UNESCO risks becoming an illusion. And to guard against this development, which is written into the genetic code of the big tech giants, we must either close the resources, go backward, or make sure the scholarly community gets into battle order also to ensure the creation of functional, technically and legally well-managed platforms on a global scale. And here UNESCO can help if it feels re ready to, to confront Google. So to conclude, I would say that today the context of budgetary restriction and the effort the effort to rationalize public action invites states and major international institutions to embrace OER. And in France, the main issue is centralization now after years of freedom. And it's crucial to, to achieve it. Teams have been set up to consider the best methods for bringing together all the free educational, cultural, and scientific resources within a single interface. Uh, creating an international interministerial body in charge of steering, coordinating, and monitoring state decisions, strengthening the digital ecosystem through public support for the regrouping of actors and the constitution of clusters, as well as the recognition and institutional valorization of participation in OER, ensuring that all publicly funded OERs are free of charge, and reforming the legal regime of copyright. One unknown factor is how the relationship between OER and the market will evolve. And we need to decide who will sort out the OER jungle, states, groups of states at regional or international level, or the market playing the Darwinist card. MIT wanted to get away from this logic 
And we've been saying for 20 years that knowledge is a common good. And for 21 hours here, we've been repeating it. However, money has a virtue. It indicates the value of things and imposes itself if it's not to be opposed. The democratization of higher education cannot therefore be achieved naturally through OER. To promote their development and dissemination, public actions and interventions will be necessary. And it is up to us to decide which ones and to implement them together and in time. And in my eyes, time is now. Thank you. Thank you.